not at all. I didn't start playing rugby till I was about 15, 16. I started quite late. Um, I was basketball, football, just playing in the streets and things like that, really. And, um, you know, I came up on the old fashioned sort of council estate and stuff. So, you know, there wasn't that sort of opportunity at all to play rugby. Didn't really know what it was. And um, it wasn't until I went to um, upper school that the rugby was was an option. Um, and I started that towards the end. And, you know, it's, <clears throat> I was one of these lads I was sort of adopted. So I ended up, didn't really see my dad for years. So I didn't really remember how big he was. <clears throat> and it wasn't until he was, you know, I met him actually just a few weeks ago. It was like, he's massive. So there was no way on earth I was ever going to be a footballer or a basketball player. But I was one of those kids that, um, when it came to it, over um, like the summer, I went from a skinny lad into like a big sort of lad and then literally got pushed onto the rugby field and uh, and never really understood it, if I was honest. Why on earth would a big lad run forwards but pass the ball backwards? I could never sort of understand the rules of rugby, I must admit, thinking, you yeah, know, this is just madness, really. But um, just just loved the actual ethos of the game and, you know, the the, the people I met, around it I call it ducks to a pond you get the same sort of ducks in the same pond and you know that's that's what I, f- I fell in love rugby with it wasn't actually the game it was the people that were, were involved there and it sort of gave me a family element to it as well and uh, Stephen in terms of that you mentioned of uh, adoption and you mentioned uh, growing up in the council estates uh, uh, there in, in England as well and uh, who was in terms of school life, in terms of academic life, uh, did you enjoy school as a kid? Did you enjoy that sort of camaraderie in times of school? Mm. Were you handy with your hands in terms of woodwork, metalwork? Was it was the idea to go down with a sort of a trades route, given that rugby at that stage was still in the amateur sort of era? Yeah, it was just one of them. You know, I actually wanted to be a policeman when I was younger. So it's, you know, I was one of these. I I love school. You know, it's I. You, there was lots of lads and glasses that were just sort of dead sort of wag school and stuff like that. And I was always like, why would you wag school? Just go and stand around when you can be in school and you're around all your friends and it's a, a nice environment. And that's what I enjoyed about it. You know, you got a good meal there at lunchtime and, you know, it's it's one of them. <clears throat> you know, I just, I've, I always sort of like school, really. Mm. And uh, Stephen, in terms of growing up, you mentioned you took up rugby at sort of 15, but as a 12, as a 13 year old, who was your hero? Who was your sporting hero? Who was the first guy that you admired that you sort of went around the streets and all your bedroom at night sort of thinking, uh, if I could meet that guy or want to be like that guy or something like that? Because obviously you were playing sports at a young age, so you must have had a, a hero as such. Yeah, I had a few sort of things because I lived in Norfolk as a kid. I got sent away to Norfolk, so I lived there and ended up following Norwich City football. Um, so you had Brian Gunn there. So, you know, if I ever played in goal, I was Brian Gunn. If I ever played on field, I was Robert Fleck. Um, but, you know, there's one that also I used to follow Northampton Town when I moved back to Northampton. And there was a footballer called Trevor Morley. He was like their captain, really good player when they won the fourth division. So it wasn't even that good when you look at it. And um, yeah, they always say never meet your heroes and stuff. Like I remember waiting when I was a kid for an autograph, and he literally just told me to f off and you know no, I'm not doing it, and sort of walked off and sort of broke me out a bit if I'm honest. So it was a bit like well, okay. So I always thought to myself, if I ever made anything of myself, I'd never be like that. Mm. And I suppose uh, Stephen as well in terms of. Northampton was where you started playing uh, rugby. You played uh, with the underage sort of teams there. But tell me the first time you probably, I don't know if you, uh, in terms of your memories of uh, Ian McGeekin, and he sort of converted you from a different sort of rugby position into a hooker, and that's how you became a hooker. Was 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 that sort of something that Ian spotted in you in terms of your rugby ability that he felt that, uh, that might be a better position for you, or was Ian a, 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 a real influence in your rugby career? Well, I was lucky. I had a few. There was a, a team manager called Keith Picton, who's who's passed away sadly now. He was like a father figure to me, and he really, you know, just took me under his wing and and stuff like that, and kept me on the straight and narrow stuff. And you know, I was playing back row um, a lot of the time, and suddenly, you know, they said, look. The game just went professional and it was the early sort of days and they said um 
was I saying? Yeah, uh, in terms of uh, Ian, Ian McGeekin, the influence of uh, Ian McGeekin in terms of converting you to uh, a hooker. Yeah, and um, so they said that you know you, you might play for England in the back row. You know you you uh, you know a great player, but if you go to the front row, he, they said, look, you just you'll just change the whole way it's played because the way you, they said you're fast, you're big, you know you're aggressive, you can do all that. But if we can get you in the front row it will just take the front row to another level. And and that's what they were saying. Um, so I was a bit like, oh, here we go. I, I'm not sure about that. But um, yeah, and suddenly it was quite a quick sort of... When it, I think I was about 20 when I changed. And, and then from then, never sort of looked back as such. Yeah. And in terms of you played an awful lot of your rugby career with uh, Northampton very uh, successful in terms of playing uh, with, with Northampton as well. Did you always feel that from 1998 to 2007 that it, it was a home for you? Was there ever a, 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 an opportunity in those sort of years to sort of venture away or were you very happy playing with the Northampton first team? Well, the problem is with all that, I've sort of got no recollection of it in yeah. probably since... 2000 early 2000s like it's the bit the bit that we've just discussed there is fine mm-hmm. i get that the the part after like most of my 20s is just sort of non-existent in my mind and you know <clears throat> when i had to do the book i spoke to people when i was like you know what went on you know why you know i was sort of northampton mainly and then suddenly i, I go off to france and stuff like that and i said well, you know what went on and they just said look we just don't know and now obviously with uh the dementia and and that diagnosis and they said look they can turn in that period of time it was like my head was like a camera but it had no sd card in so it, that's why the it was like inflamed and damaged in that period and so now when you know when people talk to me you know i meet up with lads that i played rugby with from 16 up to 20 and it's you know i can talk about it and i can understand it when you go past it's just like a i don't know so most of my england career is just non-existent you know i've <clears throat> played munster in a in the european cup final and stuff and went on that run don't really remember much of that at all like none of it there's pictures and it's just bizarre like when i was doing the documentary we were going through i found some shirts in a friend's garage and I'd played in another final, like one of these Power Gen Cup things. And I didn't even know I'd done that. You know, I literally went in and the shirt was there and it had like the print, what year it was. And we played, I can't remember who we played. And it was there printed on the shirt. And I was, said to my mate, I was like, did I play in it? And he was like, well, yeah, you did. And he, you know, it's just, it's just bizarre. Like, because people show me videos and stuff and that. And I can see like, it's a fat, ugly bloke that looks like me. But it's it's a bit like it just doesn't feel like it it was me, you know. It's like I'm watching England now. It's just on TV and it's there, and you know I get no goosebumps from it. But you know I won the county championship three years in a row with East Midlands, and that I get goosebumps about that, and I still one of the shirts for that, and that brings back memories. And I think yeah, that was you know I loved it, and then the other stuff, it's just it's just not there. Like I just talk about it and it's I'm not it sounds all I'm not that bothered by it because it's I've just got no memory no feelings towards that period of time at all and Steve uh in terms of the headaches in terms of uh that onset and that when did it start becoming uh, uh a sort of something saying something's not right here uh was was there was it was it after you started recently retired? Was it something your wife spotted or your daughters or fa- family members started spotted uh, in terms of that something was just uh, not boarding too well? It's weird. It's, I, um, when we sort of, I was living in Dubai at the time working and I went from being sociable to not sociable, but then going to meetings and not remembering stuff and coming out just like, and my whole sort of personality changed. But we just, it sounds like we just didn't think anything of it at the time. And then I sort of had a real dive and we ended up moving away from Dubai to Cyprus. And I just went into a deep depression there. And it was just like, what are we going to do? Like, we don't know. And then I came, finally we came back to England 
and I started working on the tools and we COVID hit obviously and I was fixing the big aqueducts and I was happy doing that because it was simple work, hard work, but simple work, real good and it was fine but I was still walking back to the van and suddenly I was only going back for a few tools but thinking what am I here for? I don't understand and then Alex Popham the Welsh international um, gave me a call and he started telling me about what he was going through and he I was just like I came back to my wife Steph and said oh, I spoke to a lad Alex Popham I used to play with and he's saying you know he's going through these sort of stuff and I was just like and she was like Steve that's you that's exactly what's going on with you um, and that's when the testing process so I said yeah let's, let's go through the testing process Let's, you know, go through it. And obviously I've got the diagnosis. Steve, at first, were you worried? Were you thinking to yourself it might be a tumour, it might be an, an, an aneurysm, cancer, or all sort of those anxieties sort of gripping you, thinking that maybe that it might be a, a, a life sort of condition where you might need an operation or surgery or something like that? What was that? Sorry, what was that first bit? I didn't go in at all, sorry. Yeah, uh, Steve, in terms of the first bit, uh, when, the, when the headache started coming, did you fear, first of all, that it might be a tumour or an aneurysm or something like that? Or it was there a sort of a fear in terms of like, anxiety, in terms of that, that it might be you might need an operation? We didn't even think about that at all, the, the, the brain tree or anything like that. It was just like mood swings and the memory was going like up and down. And, you know, like you said, so... I'd, I must. I put it down to just normal age at times, and I was doing a, a talk for Sports Aid, and they started asking me about the World Cup or something like that. My friend was there questioning me, and we went through, it and suddenly it was like, well, you know, I don't remember any. I don't even remember being in, in Australia at all, and it was a bit like a tumbleweed moment. And you know, I spoke to him a lot since about it. He was like, it was just bizarre because I just thought that was normal. And suddenly that's when it was like, it coincided speaking to Alex Popham as well. And they're like, no, that's not normal. You know, you should be able to. And I was just like, and then when people start looking at it and then you start getting questions by the doctors and things like that, you start thinking and, and looking and then suddenly I'm thinking, I can't remember anything. There's like nothing there. And then suddenly then it starts coming in and we got, like I said, got tested. So you are, you know, then, then, you sort of in denial until you get the results. One minute you think, yeah, I've got a real problem. Then suddenly you're like, no, I'm absolutely fine. But then, then, then all of a sudden you get the results and, you know, at first it's like, thank God I've got something wrong with me. I'm not, you know, it's because there's nothing worse sometimes when you, you feel ill, you go to the doctors and they go, well, everything's fine. There's, there's nothing wrong with you, but you know, there is. So, you know, when you get that back and in your mind, it's very much like, this is quite good because, there is something wrong with me. So that means if there's something wrong, we can fix it. But then suddenly then you go through it and it's like, no, there's there's no fix for this. It's just going to gradually get worse. Um, we don't know if it's going to be months, few years or 10 years down the line, you know, it's, but you know, you can feel it and, you know, do the tests and you can just feel that things are. And, you know, I've, I speak to a, a doctor Gavin and you know I mentioned him in in the uh, on the TV program I'd done on the BBC and if it wasn't for him I'd, I'd I'd have been dead by now I would have killed myself and there's a couple of times when I've been so close by the trains and and things like that that it's just like you get to a point where I'm so low and things and then they've introduced me now to like medication for it and things like that and I'm on like a um epilepsy medicine that tries to bridge over the damage in the brain so it, it takes the highs the top highs away and it takes the top lows so you're a bit more level and for me that's what I want for my kids I've got four young kids Steph and wife you know I feel guilty for I've dragged them into this um but for me now it's about me being the best I can for for them and the big saying I have is you know I want my kids to come and see me when I'm older I'm not have to come and see me you know and I don't want them to make choices of university and things like that on the back of having to care for dad um and help mum so you know that's the big point now of why we're trying to do things that we are and Steve when you look at rugby now and you see rugby on tv and you see rugby is there a bit of anger towards rugby 
Are you feeling a bit, look, Rugby gave me so much, but Rugby has taken away so much from me as well? Um, not, not really angry. It's like, at first, I just didn't understand it. Well, obviously, we get a diagnosis and you look back now. But the whole point is for us, you know, there's there's no point in me being angry and bitter and stuff like that. I've got, you know, four kids I've got to try and live on, live with and give them a good life. And, you know, the game's there. It's, oi, sorry. The game's there. Uh, and we've just got to try and make it the safe we can for people to play it. You know, people are going to carry on playing it. But for us, we just need people to know what the benefits are, but then also what the downside is. And, you know, since we've come out over the last two years, there's been some drastic, big changes. Um, and, you know, I'll get so many people now. At the beginning, they were a bit like, what are you doing? You know, you're just bitter because you can't play anymore and all this. You're just making it up. To now, they can see it. And, you know, I'll get people when, you know, if I go to a game of rugby or even walking down the street saying, look, thanks so much for, all, you know, putting your your head out the, the parapet and stuff. You know, you've, you've put your head above there and, you know, you took a lot of abuse at the beginning, but now we are sort of saving people. And, you know, it's a great game, like I said. And I take my kids down to the junior club. Will I let them play tackle rugby? No, I won't. But will I let them go down there? Can they play touch? Can they have fun down there with the people down there? Yes, because I totally agree with the people down there and things. But for me, there's still a downside to it. And rugby's become too professional all the way down through. And that's not, you know, I'm not one of these people, oh, you know, someone's on X amount of money and they shouldn't be. It's like, if someone got paid £10 million, I'd shake their hand and go, absolutely fair play to you. Do you know what I mean? I'm not one of them bitter people at all. It's like, get as much as you can from it because, you know, you deserve it. But when you start seeing all down the junior clubs, everyone's taping games, they're doing debriefs, they're doing this, they're doing that. People, some people are going to the gym, some people aren't going to the gym. So then these people collide at the weekends on the pitch and that's why you get so many injuries now. And it's a shame, you know, it's just it's sort of, like I said, the professionalism come has come all the way down, but it hasn't been able to handle it because it is a full contact sport and it's become so organised at all levels that there isn't space on the pitch. There isn't, even when I see kids play tag rugby, the first thing a new coach will do is put a defensive system in place and get them standing in a line just to play touch rugby. Why are they not running around trying to pass the ball as much? They're all there and it's just a shame. We just want to try and change it. You know, rugby needs to change now because it's such a good game. You know, you, you, you can use your foot, you use your hands, you, you know, all this and there's so much fitness in it as well that you can use when you're doing touch rugby and stuff that I think there's a lot of benefits that can come out of that. Uh, Steve Th Stephen Thompson, uh, a, a wonderful dare I say, a career for you in terms of all your accomplishments and your achievements uh, throughout the game. But a very sort of touching story that you've mentioned with us on air uh, this evening as well. Uh, your book is out at the moment, Unforgettable. It's in, in all uh, nationwide and all stores across Ireland. We urge all our listeners, viewers to go out, read uh, Steve's uh, story, take on advice, the lessons that he preaches on the sort of story. Uh, stay safe uh, uh, mind your health and body and mind as well. And uh, Stephen Thompson, we wish you all the well uh, and all the best in, in battling uh, the condition that is on set to you. We wish you happy times ahead and uh, joyful uh, memories to come. This is your story, Stephen Thompson, my life in rugby, global rugby, le rugby legends, a World Cup winner. You have deserved uh, that right to be inter entered into that bracket, uh, an NBE winner as well. Uh, such a, a memorable uh, career, a British and Irish line, uh, 78 appearances for England, 20 points, uh, uh, debut in the Six Nations against uh, Scotland, a Grand Slam winner as well. Stephen Thompson, a pleasure talking to you today, sir. We will in your future endeavours. Uh, stay safe and take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.